All right, so let's jump into it. So the agenda here, um, we're gonna start off, I'll briefly go over what we're gonna do today and welcome some of the awesome people that are on the call today to help answer all of our seed questions. We'll have a keynote seed inspiration from special guest Ben Cohen, followed up with a reading with Janice Ray from the Seed Underground, which I am so excited for. Um, then we'll take a quick little self-care break. If you need to run and get a coffee or use the restroom, feel free to do that. And then we're gonna come back and have a facilitated Q&A discussion with the teachers. And with that, I am going to jump right in. So um, as we are going through this today, I would like you to keep in mind two things and you can share these in the chat, you can share them in the doc, you can think about it and get back to us later. But as we go through this, what do you need to be supported in your seed journey? What's this look like for you? Do you need more access to information, some one-on-one -on -one support, more videos, webinars? We wanna know how to keep you supported as you learn more about seeds. And what do you have to offer? What can you bring to this community of seed keepers that we are trying to weave together? Maybe you have land to grow out seeds that are harder for some of us. Maybe you're a great teacher and a facilitator and you can help us spread the gospel around seeds, whatever that looks like for you and how you can contribute to this. So what do you need to be supported and what can you offer? So um, I am Melissa Dasaw, for those of you that don't know me, and I'm excited to see a lot of people on this call who I don't know. So welcome to Working Food, welcome to the world of seeds. Um, I'm here today with our amazing team of Working Food women that have helped make all of this happen. Um, we do a lot of work around local food systems, We've got Anna Prizia and Sarah Sterling and Ashley Rella here on the call. And I think some of our staff are also Zooming in from afar. We've got Jessie and Lauren's out doing the market now. She'll be in soon. Um, so I invite you to explore Working Foods website and learn a little bit more about us and also our social media. We have a lot of great programs uh, to do with working or to do with local food rather. We've got a youth garden and science education program, a culinary incubator program, and currently our response to COVID has been a meal relief program using local food and local businesses and a farmer's market drive through which is happening right now just outside our door. So learn more about us through all these outlets we've got for you and uh, feel free to keep in touch. And of course, our pivotal program, the Southern Heritage Seed Collective, which is why you are all here today. And I'm not sure how you got here, but I'm certainly glad you landed here, my little seeds. So this is our fourth annual Southern Seed School. And of course this year we're online and we've not done this before. This is new territory for us. So welcome to our exploration of trying to teach online. Uh, it took a little bit of acceptance on my part and some adjusting to learn how to do this. We've always done this in person, but it's been amazing. We went from having no more than 25 people in our little seed classroom at Grow Hub to now 216 people that have registered to learn about seeds. So it's incredible um, and I'm grateful for everyone being able to come from all corners of our state and even from out of state to join us here. So thank you. Um, and also we've cut down on our carbon footprint by doing this format. So good on us. So I'm Melissa again, and I got here because of Anna actually. Um, I studied wildlife and ecosystems and I had no idea 14 years ago about anything with food. I never had a garden. I didn't even think about food other than that. I just needed to eat it. And then Anna came into my life and got me involved in slow food. And it's funny how life unfurls. And here we are 14 years later with a nonprofit that is at the front line of doing food systems work. So um, you never know where your path is going to take you. And I'm super grateful now and admit that I am totally head over heels in love with this community and with seeds and with food and so excited to be here with you guys today. And we have some incredible people on the call with us that have been an inspiration to me in my seed journey, have taught me a lot and contributed a great amount to the community around local food and seed saving and educations and connections. And I'm gonna briefly introduce who's on the line and that'll help you also and Anna and Sarah to direct questions to some of these people that come in with some really great expertise. So we've got Angela Minow on the line, and she's an awesome homesteader, seed steward. She's a mother, a homeschooler, an artist, and probably a lot more. She's helped with a lot of our seed replenishment projects over the past few years, notably with some really important crops to our region. She's helped keep the Dudley Farm heirloom corn from going extinct. She is working with us to keep Farmer John Daikon's radish going. 
among many other things. And she's also working on improving her own line of adapted winter squash to her homestead. And you can read a lot about her amazing work on her blog, Toadstools and Fairy Rings. And she does a lot of workshops on her farm too. Once we're allowed to gather again, hopefully you can follow along with what she does. She's a wealth of information and an amazing seed person. Jennifer Rex is on the line. She's a very experienced gardener in North Florida. She's been gardening here for 20 years. She brings a lot of depth of knowledge to gardening and soil building and seed saving. She's a seed school graduate from a couple of years ago. And among many things, she's developed a fondness for indigo, which is an amazing dye plant and also a good soil building plant. So she's on the line to help answer some of our questions. Sadly, Joseph Pierce is not here today. He's our plant propagator guru. He's from Micanopy. He's got a major irrigation leak going on at his homestead right now that he's attending to. Um, but there's a great video of Joe on our website and our YouTube channel you can check out. Kathy Patterson. Hi, Kathy, I can see you. She's the co-owner with her and her partner, Bruce, of Lost Valley Farm in Shiloh, Florida, which is near Micanopy. And they operate a U-Pick Blackberry operation. They've also done Roselle U-Pick um, and recently turned some of their property into a native wildflower seed production site. And they are amateurs in all of this, but their success has been phenomenal. And you can also see a little bit more about what they did through the video we did to cover them. So thanks to them, there's tons of native wildflowers in gardens around our area and dotting the roadsides of Florida. So thank you to them for all the incredible work they've done. And two of our out of town guests that I'm so excited are here, uh, Ben Cohen and Ben and I led a seed librarian summit yesterday with Naomi Baxter, who's also on the line. And that had 50 people from around the state, new seed librarians that wanna get started, experienced ones. It was a really great opportunity. And he is the man to talk about it. He started over 70 seed libraries in his home state of Michigan. He's an herbalist, an author, a gardener, a seed saver, an educator, and we're so grateful that Ben is here today. He runs Small House Farm, and he's the founder of Michigan Seed Library. And you can read more about Ben's work on his website, smallhousefarm.com. Yep, .com, not .org. Um, and he'll be speaking with us here shortly. And last but certainly not least, Janice Ray. Oh my gosh, how exciting and what an honor to have you here today. You were an inspiration to me in my seed journey long ago. I think Anna handed me the book and it just transformed the way I looked at seeds and food. So we're really excited to have Janice here. She's an award-winning author, a naturalist, an environmental advocate hailing from Georgia and very familiar with some of our ecosystems and places here in North Florida as well with a real deep connection to the South. And her book, The Seed Underground, A Growing Revolution to Save Food, has truly been an inspiration and instructional manual for a lot of us here. And she's also been a contributor to Audubon, Orion, and other magazines, and also a commentator for NPR's Living on Earth. So what a crowd we have here today. Thank you, thank you for this collection of amazing people with experiences to share with us. Um, and with that, I am going to turn this over to Ben to inspire us about seeds and get us going on our seed journey here today. Ben, welcome. Hello, everybody. Oh my gosh, isn't this fun? Uh, what a cool thing we're doing here. Uh, you can see my name uh, is Elijah Cohen because that's my IT guy. That's my 11-year-old son um, who's helped me set this up. It's been such an adventure to get to visit everybody in this digital wonderland um and, and it, we should just be blessed through these challenges that we do get to spend this time together even though not in person we do get to share some ideas and thoughts and that that's really a neat thing um like melissa said my name is ben cohen and i'm from small house farm which is located right in the central uh center michigan um you know small house is what i call an effort in sustainable living we, we grow a majority of our food here on site uh, we also have uh, seed production and such that we offer uh, retail through our website as well as wholesale to some accounts. And um, I'm blessed to live across the street from 1,100 acres of woods. So we do a lot of foraging out there for our food as, as well as our medicine. Um, so that's kind of just a little, little bit about what we do here. Um, again, I'm just so excited to be a part of this to see so many seed savers and future seed savers coming together for something like this. Um, you know, as, as seed savers, to some extent, we, we already understand the reason 
why we were brought to seeds or, or why seeds came to us. Um, but I like, I like to talk about the why of seed saving. You know, the, the Southern Seed School, the resources that Melissa put together, um, it's just astounding. Absolutely, what an amazing resource. Um, but a lot of it is really focused on how to save seeds, obviously. But if we don't think about the why of what we're doing and we just focus on the how, I find that at that point, it's just mechanics. It's just function. And if we think about why we save our seeds, that's what gives life to our work. So as seed savers, you know, there, there's some obvious whys that we talk about. Um, oh, historical preservation, right? Anybody that knows me knows that the, the, the history and cultures and the songs of the people that have saved the seeds before us is really my driving force for why I'm involved in seed saving, um, the, the preservation of history, certainly. But also, you know, we talk a lot about the preservation of genetics, genetic preservation, um, to ensure the germplasm is there, not only for us to reach back into these old varieties, but for us to have access to that to create the, the varieties of tomorrow, the heirlooms of tomorrow, right? Um, the genetic preservation, which folds right into the next reason that we always talk about, which is adaptability, local adaptation of our seeds, right? Which comes into play as, as local food activists, you know, having seeds that are adapted to our local regions that are gonna perform the best, that's important to us. Um, in, in today's climate change scenario that we're dealing with, it's obviously more important than ever before to think about that adaptability of our seeds. But really, to me, those two things are one and the same, and they fall under the umbrella of, of simple food security. And as, as seed savers and local food activists and growers and gardeners or whatever angle that we come to this world from, our driving force is always the same food security, ensuring that people have access to healthy, nutritious food. And adaptability and genetic preservation, those are the same thing to me. Um, if we think about indigenous populations, if we think about the original seed savers, if you will, um, obviously they understood that the seeds that they saved carried the songs of their people. But at the end of the day, their driving force was food security, growing healthy, nutritious food to make sure that they could survive now and then through the winter. And that's really why all of us come to the seeds together, is for food security. So I think sometimes of the awakenings of seed savers, right? The awakening that we have. And I can think of three great awakenings in the seed saving movement. The first would be maybe around uh, 1800 or so, um, when the first commercial seed company started to open here in America. In the States, it was, uh, I think it was about 1790 when the Shakers first started to, to sell seeds commercially, right? And that quickly became, became a thing on the horizon was, was commercial seed sales. And, and folks, till that point, had always saved their own seeds and shared their own seeds, and that was just second nature. And once commercial seed companies came onto the, onto the landscape, um, it, it became far too easy to, to give the control of these seeds over to these companies and to rely on purchasing these seeds from somebody in the future. And well, seed companies are in, are in business for one thing, like any company is, and that's simply to make money. And if certain products don't sell, they quit offering those products. And if we were to rely on these seed companies to provide these products for us and they quit selling them, what comes to mind, I guess, to me first is uh, Thorburn's terracotta tomato. That may be a bit tomato that you guys are familiar with. Um, you know, it was last seen in the Thorburn seed catalog, 1893, it's kind of a brownish tomato, really, uh, it's a unique specimen, certainly. Um, but after 1893, you couldn't find it commercially anywhere. And the folks that didn't save their seeds that relied on buying that seed from the seed company realized that they weren't going to be able to grow that tomato anymore. And it was functionally extinct until William Moyes Weaver found it in his grandpa's freezer. Until then, it was gone. So there was that first awakening where people started to realize that when we rely on seed companies to provide us with our seeds, we're not relying on ourselves. And if we don't provide for ourselves, how can we have a sustainable local food system? Um, can't have farms without seeds, right? All right, so then I think maybe the second awakening would have been around oh, 1930. 1920, 1930, when hybrid seeds came into the market, 
right? The first hybrid corn, I think, came out in 1927 or something like that. And farmers were convinced for one reason or another the hybrids were the wave of the future, far superior to the heirlooms that they'd grown before that point. And we're not here to debate the pros and cons of hybrid seeds, most certainly, at least not right at this moment. Um, but what happened was the farmers gave up control of the most basic input for their farm, the seeds, over to the seed company. And for whatever reasons they believe that these hybrid seeds were important, when they weighed that out with the importance of having their own seeds, they felt that buying seeds was more sensible for them. And suddenly we found ourselves in a dire situation, a dire situation where our entire food system is dependent upon purchased seeds. And if we're going to look at the aspects of seed saving from food security, it's not a secure food system at all, right? And the hybrids quickly rolled into what we deal with nowadays with uh, patented seeds, genetically modified crops, contracts, and that sort of thing. And we've realized that whoever controls the seeds controls the food. Whoever controls the food controls the people. And as seed savers, we know that when we save and share our seeds in our community, we have food security. When somebody else controls our seeds, we do not. And then the last awakening that I can think of is one that we're literally living in right now. It's happening right now with this COVID situation. Suddenly we've realized when we go to the grocery store that the shelves are empty. There's not food on the shelves. You go to buy seeds from the seed companies. Seed companies are so overwhelmed. Some of them have had to shut down. Some of them are so far behind. They're running out of stock. And suddenly we realize that once again, we've put ourselves into a situation where we're relying on outside inputs for these most basic things in life. And that brings us to where we're at today, where as seed savers, we come together and we see that saving and sharing our seeds amongst communities provides us the food security that we need, not only for ourselves, but for all of our communities. And when all of you go home to wherever you're coming from right now, right, back to your communities to do the work that you do, you realize that the local seeds in your communities are essential to the food security of the people that you care for. When we buy seeds from someone else, we give up the control of life. I'm going to tell you a story real quick. So think about community. Community is really the last reason that I think that we all save seeds. Um, and again, it falls under the same umbrella as food security and everything else that we do. It's the community that we can build and grow and make better with local food systems. You can't have a local food system without a local seed system. Food is only as local as the seed that grows it. A few years ago, I went down to Livingston, Tennessee to go to a seed swap um, at the Sustainable Mountain Agriculture Center. Um, it was an event hosted by Bill Best. If you don't know who Bill Best is, write that down. Uh, Bill Best is a literal superhero. Um, Bill Best lives down in Berea, Kentucky, and he maintains the largest collection of Appalachian beans in the country. Um, he also maintains a number of tomatoes, peppers, and things like that, but beans is kind of his mainstay, right? Um, and Bill knows the history of, of these beans. Verifiable stories, names, counties, places, people. And through these seeds, he's able to maintain that culture and that sense of place that's so important when we think about our food. So anyways, Bill puts on this event, Sustainable Mountain Agriculture Seed Swap. Um, it's like a mecca for people like me, man. We travel from all around to come to this event. Um, you know, and some of us, that, that kind of go on this the circuit of seed swaps we kind of become like family in a way you know we all have the same mental illness i suppose where we'll travel hundreds and thousands of miles to get to these seed swaps um and at, at times it's the only time that we get to spend time with each other it's like a family reunion really you know um when we get together and we catch up and talk about our gardening challenges and share our seeds and um it's just really a nice time and because it, we so it's, it's so infrequent that we get to see each other, um, you know, we, we want to make it the most of it. And so after the seed swaps, we'll always go have a meal, get together and share a meal and, and spend some time um, catching up. And this particular event a couple of years ago, we were in Livingston, Tennessee. And afterwards, we went to a, a catfish fry, the frying up catfish. And, you know, it was the whole, the whole thing, the cornbread and the catfish, hush puppies, okra. Oh, man, I ate okra twice a day that whole trip. Um, you can't get enough okra, right? Uh, it was such a good time. But you know, when you're eating all this food, fried food, you only eat so much of it. And you come to this moment, I call it like the moment of clarity, 
where you got to kind of stop and catch your breath, wipe the grease off your face. I looked around at all the people, and I happened to be fortunate enough to be sitting at the end of a table. We had put a lot of tables at this restaurant together. There was quite a few of us. Bill's event's a big one, so there's a lot of us that were there. And uh, this long, long table of folks. And I was sitting there catching my breath, and I was looking at all these people, just thinking about how cool it is that we all get to come together. And I started to think about all these people. And, you know, we came from so many different places to get together that day. We came from so many different backgrounds, histories, cultures. There's people there from different countries, different ethnicities, different religions, different political affiliations. The differences amongst us were many. But that wasn't why we were there that day. We were there for what brought us together. We were there for our commonality, right? The seeds that brought us all together. If we'd have been discussing any of those other things, we may not have seen eye to eye, but none of that mattered. All that mattered was what brought us together, our seeds. And in today's world, it seems more divisive than ever. And when you can find these commonalities, these things that bring us together, it's one of the most powerful medicines that we can share with people today. And as I sat there at that table, looking at all the people, I had to ask myself a question, which is the same question I'm going to ask you. Are we saving the seeds or are the seeds saving us? And I think we all know the answer to that question. So anyways, I'm very excited to be a part of this event and to be here with all of you. And I'm really looking forward to hearing, hearing from the Seed Underground and, and listening to all your questions and sharing in this community. It's such an honor for me to be a part of this and to see once again, the seeds bring us all together. Thank you guys very much. Wow, thank you, Ben. That was incredible. Um, whew. I need, need to sit with that for a few seconds before we just move on. All right, Anna, do you want to segue us into our next, our next moment here? Sure. Uh, so I think uh, we're going to move into, sorry, I have to pull up my agenda. I want to make sure I'm doing everything absolutely correct. Um, I, so we're going to, kind of move into a reading and a reflection from Janice. She's going to share with us a reading from the Seed Underground, which was mentioned at the beginning of the um, session. And uh, once she's done with that, we will uh, open it up for a Q&A. Uh, we do have a organized set of questions that came in from the surveys we sent to you and at the bottom of the agenda. Um, that was also sent. That agenda is a Google Doc. So if you have a question that comes up for you while you were listening to Ben, while you're listening to Janice, if you could um, please, if you're able, go into that Google Doc and type it in there. Um, it will allow us to hang on to questions in case we don't get to them all today. Um, if that feels a little overwhelming to you, you can also put your questions in the chat. Um, I will let you know that we, we are not going to be answering questions today about general gardening. So how do I compost? You know, where do I get soil? How can I get starts? Um, what vegetables grow, you know, better in the spring? Like, I mean, some of that kind of relates to seed saving and may come up, but just know that if you have those questions um, and you want them answered, you can feel free to submit them. We'll save them, we'll look at them, and, and it'll help us to think about content that we need to develop for the future. But um, don't be too dismayed if your questions don't get answered today. Uh, we will do our best to get you an answer if we can't get to you. So um, with that, I'm going to turn it to Janice. And um, as Melissa said, she's been an inspiration to us since the beginning of this journey. So I'm very excited to hear from her. And I'm really grateful to her for taking the time to be here today. Janice? You've heard what's happening with seeds. They're disappearing about like everything else. You know the story already. You know it better than I do. The forest and the songbirds, the Appalachian mountains, the fish in the ocean. 
but I'm not going to talk about anything that'll make us feel hopeless or despairing because there's no despair in a seed. There's only life waiting for the right conditions, sun and water, warmth and soil to be set free. Every day, millions upon millions of seeds lift their two green wings. Thank you so much, everybody, for being here on this just a glorious Saturday morning. I, I really can't wait for 12 o'clock to get here because I've, I've got a date in the garden myself. Um, I'm so delighted and thankful to be able to speak to you. I, I fell in love with gardening and seeds when I was very young. We live in Southern Georgia in Tattnall County near Reedsville on a farm of 46 acres that we call Red Earth. I live here with my husband who's a painter and, and we have a teenage daughter. Um, we try to grow as much food for ourselves and our friends and our family as we can. We sell a few things, but not much. I wrote The Seed Underground, which came out in 2012 with, because we were, I think there's been no time in the history of humankind that we've paid more attention to food than we have now. Um, it hasn't, however, been the heyday. This time right now is not the heyday of food. It's just we're paying attention. We have the food channel going, you know, 24-7. We are starting to understand uh, organic, why it's important to eat more, you know, food without, grown without pest, pesticides and chemicals. And we're starting to understand local, why food grown close to home is better for you and better for the planet. But I felt when I was thinking about this book that we were not understanding seeds, that uh, this corporate robbery is being played out on a grand scale in this country. And if we don't have, as Ben was saying, sovereignty over our, our seed supply, then we don't have a we don't have a secure food supply. I, I really, there's a, another layer to the whole thing and why I wrote the book. And that is that I, I've been, I'm a nature writer. I've written about lots of grief, lots of landscapes that have lots of places that are lost, landscapes that are incredibly diminished. But I saw in the 1990s and early 2000s, uh, this, beautiful movement, especially driven by young people, by millennials, to reclaim the food supply. Um, it, the whole thing just was giving me so much hope. Uh, once, many years ago, I attended a conference at Firing, Firing Grit with Orion Magazine, and, and I saw Gary Navahan, who was the first person to do this, begin, he was eating food within uh, 80 square, 80 miles of his place. And he said he was trying to use food to weave his life back together. I thought, I thought that was so amazing. And that's really why so many young people had taken up this mantle of there are so many things about corporate culture and industrialization that we can't control. But one of the things that we can control is how we feed ourselves and how we eat. So this book was written for young people in hopes that, you know, given all the bad news in the world, that you would start building, that we would all start building. Um, I wanna read you just one little section out of the book, but I wanna to talk to you a little bit more, but let me read you these two parts here. Even though I may not know you, I've fallen in love with you. You who understand that a relationship to the land is powerful, who want that connection, who want authentic experiences, who want a life that has meaning, that makes sense, that is essential. And I am writing for you, you. This story is for you. This is not a textbook on seed saving. I am looking to inspire you. And then one other little piece. I want to tell you about the most hopeful thing in the world. It's a seed. In the era of dying, it is all life. 
every piece of information necessary to that plant for its natural time on earth is encoded, even though the world is changing and new information will be needed. But we don't know what's in a seed, its knowledge invisible, encased, secret. A seed can contain a whole tree encrypted in its sealed vault. Even with climate change, there will be seeds that have all the wisdom we need. So um, just a little bit, getting just a tiny, tiny bit into uh, what happened. Um, Susanna Chapman and a couple of other researchers at the University of Georgia did a survey where they looked at seed that was available in seed catalogs uh, in, I think, uh, 1950 and compared it with basically 2000. And they found that in this 50 year period that we had lost um, huge numbers of seeds, 95% of cabbages. You know, you don't, you don't even, you just think of 96% oh, of field corns. 94% of peas, 81% of tomatoes. You know, we go to the supermarket and we can choose from gold delicious, red delicious, Macintosh, apples, Granny Smith, not even thinking that in 1900, there were hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of varieties of apples and it's hard to believe, but the same was true of everything, even something like okra, you know? Like how could there have been so many types of collards, glazed collards and unglazed collards and blue collards. Right now, you know, like there are three kales growing in my garden, but we had hundreds of kales. So I started, you know, thinking about we're losing food and, you know, why, why are we losing it? Fewer of us are living in rural places at all. 83% um, of people in this country uh, now live in urban areas, most of whom can't have a garden. And uh, overall, globally, it's the, we've now, uh, we've now exceeded 50% of the world doesn't have a, a, play, a piece of land. Um, among the people even living close to the land, fewer are farming. And then um, what really happened to seeds, and, and Ben talks a lot about this and can do a much better job of it, but we, we just, we let, we let the green revolution, the so-called green revolution, uh, really, um, feed us. We, we thought that seed saving and gardening was too hard of, of work and it was much easier to go to the store and buy things. But now we find ourselves, in the, in the book I go through these 10 things, which I'm, I'll just go quickly. I write about all of them extensively. Our food is going extinct. Our food is being stolen from us. Our food is being bought out from under us. And there I'm talking about, you know, the merging of seed companies, small seed companies into larger seed companies, small farms into large farms. Bad food is being forced on us. And, and I think about this too with coronavirus and, and thinking about the places in Georgia, we have a, a county called Darty County, which is, uh, it's a very, a very low income county that's been incredibly hard hit with coronavirus. 120 deaths so far in Daugherty County. And it's, it's just that bad food is forced on people without, re without options, without choices and resources. And we suffer because of it. Our food is, is hazardous to our health. And here I think I'm not going to talk about GMOs, but this is a huge, this is a big reason why my husband and I try to eat all organic. We try, you know, we try to stay as far away from glyphosate, the active ingredient in Roundup as we can. Um, our food is harming the earth. Uh, our food annihilates pollinators. Our food is nutritionally impotent and our food threatens democracy. We're, we're in order to maintain democracy, I believe we need to have the freedom and the ability to grow for ourselves. In 
um, somewhere in the 90s, 95 or so, this researcher in Texas named Dr. Don Davis, he did a study looking at 43 garden crops and he found that the, just using the USDA nutrient tables, um, he found that, so wait a minute, let me, let me say this, I'm mixing these two things up. The Chapman study at UGA looked at varieties and seed catalogs between 1900 and 2000, so a hundred year span. And Don Davis is looking at USDA tables between 1950 and, and 2000. Yeah, I've got that right. So he found these incredible declines in nutrients in food, um, like 18% riboflavin, 12 or 13% calcium, declines in vitamin C, all across the board, these declines in food. And, and that is our food becoming you know, nutritionally impotent. And a huge reason, so, if everyone can please mute themselves, uh, there's a few folks on the call that are not muted. We need everyone to mute themselves, please. Denise, you're muted, so you'll have to unmute yourself again. We had to mute everybody. Thank you. Okay, thank you. So the changes in these 50 years that led to nutritional declines are that we began, you know, corporations began to um, buy, take, steal more and more of our varieties. We began to lose more and more varieties. And we began to grow with the Green Revolution foods that, that had better yield, they were selected for growth rate, for pest resistance, for uniformity, all of them coming right at, ripe at the same time so that they could get the, the heart, the shipment out. We were, we were um, growing food for looks, for disease resistance, for adaptations to an environment, and we were not growing food for nutrition. So there, all this brings me to my main point. There are many, many reads, reasons to save seeds, to grow food, to save seeds, to share seeds, to grow your own seeds out. But I believe one of the main reasons is our, our health, our sanity, and the health of the world around us. I say this as a nature writer. So that's, that's why I do it. I, I think this is also a good time for me to say that I am not devoting my life to saving tons of varieties of seeds. I try, I do a lot of trials here when I'm growing. And if something is fabulous, like um, I saw Melissa had put, you know, in the chart where people are writing their favorite uh, heirloom or vintage vegetable, she had written Seminole pumpkin. Um, there's a bag of Seminole pumpkin seeds. Um, we save this pumpkin is an amazing pumpkin for South Georgia, North Florida, incredibly prolific, resistant to diseases. Anybody would be crazy not to be growing this pumpkin. Behind me, you can see a large bowl full of ones still left over from last, maybe these were harvested in probably July. We're still eating them. Um, I believe that we have some fabulous seed companies. I'm gonna name just a few, High Mowings. Um, I just ordered, actually, I ordered just from Ben, um, Orange Eggplant. We have So True Seeds in Asheville. Uh, let's see, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange out of Virginia. We have some wonderful people who are who are hiring folks to grow out seeds. And that honestly is more what I'm doing now than anything. I'm saving the things that I love to grow that are adapted to my place and that I can't get anywhere else. And otherwise I'm throwing my money as I need to at small seed companies. 
or at people who are growing some kind of seed and they let me know about it and I buy it. Let me read you this very last part because um, I don't want to run out of time just yap, just um, yakking at you. And I'm going to stay on so that if you have any questions that I might be able to answer. I want to one more time to remind you of the most powerful thing in the world. It's a seed. In the era of transition between the age of industrialization and the Ecozoic era, a seed is life. Because we don't know what's sealed in it, it can contain anything. Everything the seed has needed to know is there. Every morning I wake with fears and griefs. There are so many. I wake now into the news of storms and pandemics. When the storms have passed, what will we need to rebuild? We will need seeds. There's at least one in each of you. There's a bank of seeds within you. Let them grow. Agriculture has created in us a story-based, community-reliant, land-loving people. It's given us a head start on what I call the age of bells, the time when bells, cowbells, dinner bells, the bells of wildflowers will again be ringing across the hills and plains. I believe that the organic and lo local food movement is leading the way to recreating cultures vibrant and vital. What we are witnessing in agriculture is no less than a revolution. And thank you all for being on the front lines. It also means we're on an edge. When I think of an edge, I think first of the literal one, the fence row, which modern chemical agriculture has been destroying. This is a, a place where birds poop out wild cherry seeds and wild cherry trees grow. And the place where tired from the row, workers sit in the shade and tell stories. We occupy an edge between forest and field, the most exciting place in the world to me. We're on many edges, balancing the needs of the wild with the need to nourish people, balancing urban life with the need to eat, balancing concerns about human health with the need for productivity, weighing input against output, making decisions based on both ecology and economy. There's also a psychological edge we're all living on. We know we're living in a world being devastated, but one also replete with the beauty and power of life. We live on the boundary of deciding to make positive contributions, although we know we're implicit in destruction. We skate between apathy, because the truth of what's happening is painful, versus action, any kind of action. Every decision we have to make, whether it's life-sustaining or life-destroying, is an edge. Our very psyches are on the edge between dropping in and dropping out, between selling out and fighting back. Every single one of us. The Verge is a dangerous and frightening place. It's important to know that one is not alone on it. The edge holds a tremendous amount of ecological and cultural as well as intellectual power. I believe we have to get comfortable with it. How shall we live as if we believe in the future, as if every one of us is a seed, which you know is a sacred thing? In my wildest dreams, the seeds of every species are speaking to me calling out in all the bare spots on earth, plant us and let us grow. On all the edges, plant seeds. I've been asked a hundred times, am I hopeful? Do, how do I find hope? Do I stay hopeful? How? The assumption is that hope is a prerequisite for action. Without hope, one becomes depressed and then unable to act. Do you feed your daughter because you have hope that she'll turn out okay? Hope is important to me, but I wanna stress that I do not act because I have hope. I act whether I have hope or not. It's useless to rely on hope as motivation to do what's necessary and just and right. Why doesn't anybody ever talk about love as motivation? So the question, how do I stay hopeful becomes ludicrous. It should be, how do I stay love filled? I'll tell you how. I wake every morning 
listening to that, to the great crested flycatcher call from the pear tree. And I watched that fat old orange sun always burning rise flamboyantly over the pecan orchard. I watch green glazed collards go to seed. I watch hummingbirds in the red valentines of pigeon peas. Before bed, I walk outside and gaze up through the bare limbs of swamp chestnut oak into the starry, starry sky above Red Earth Farm, and I watch a meteor blaze a trail to Earth. I may not have a lot of hope, but I have plenty of love. We're going to have to fall in love with place again and learn to stay put. We're going to have to fall in love with each other. We're going to have to learn courage and take action. We're going to have to ignore that good ideas have been marginalized and rush them back to the center of attention. I say it's the new moon. Plant intentions. Don't burn them in a fire. Get really, really clear. It's going to be a powerful time. Sink into the place underground that seeds deserve. I say, rev up your awesome. And oh my gosh, I'm just talking to the wrong people with this reading because you already have. Look at what you guys are doing in Gainesville. It's just amazing, phenomenal. Look around, so many people have put their shoulders into the load. You, find a place to push. Pick up a tool, a hoe, or a shovel. Start turning the compost bin to make the soil in which the seed will grow. You will begin at the center, the center of many concentric circles that expand further and further out from you. You will become a local hero and a local rock star. And from there, your influence will wash outward, even across the globe where so many people are rising up like germinating embryos to claim food sovereignty, to rescue local seeds, and to guard human civilization's cornucopia. Come home, have the courage to live the life you dream. There's nothing greater. Many of our seeds have been lost forever, but we can protect what's left. And in our revolutionary gardens, we can develop the heirlooms of the future. Are you gonna farm her up or just lay there and bleed? So thank you all. Thank you for being here today, for giving up a couple of hours of a really precious, beautiful Saturday morning to be together and think about seeds and talk about seeds. Thank you again for having me. Um, I was inspired by Ben. I did two things, and this is sort of um, monetary marketing things here, but I have um, an Amazon seller page, and I put the seed underground on it this morning for $9.99. That's basically what I can buy them for. And um, I think you'll have to pay about 3 or $4 for shipping, but, uh, but there's copies. My seller account on Amazon is called Professor of Junk. <laughs> My dad... My dad died in December and he, um, he ran a junkyard, as you know, from my first book. And in, anyway, my dad is really the professor of junk. But if you want the seed underground, there are though some used copies online, which I saw and that you can get, I think one even as, as inexpensively as $4. And then the second thing is there's the library also. Please, if your library is open, feel free to check out the book there. That would make me so happy. And the second thing is I happen to have an extra copy. Wait, let me, let me show you. Let me hold up the Seed Underground. Looks like this. And here's Ben's book. Um, looks like this. And I have an extra copy of Seed to Seed. Oops, this way. Um, this is a wonderful manual by Suzanne Ashworth that tells you just plant by plant how to save seeds. I'm, I will, if I just posted a post on my Facebook page that just has a, you'll see it, it's the last one I did, and it has a bunch of um, pictures of seeds and seedlings that I just took this morning. If you make a comment in that section, 
I will just choose somebody or, you know, draw somebody out of the hat. Well, let's just say we'll give it 24 hours and I'll send you this book seed to seed and also some packets of seed that I really love and, and save and keep going. Um, I could keep talking, but I feel that we should stop there and um, thank you all again. Wow, thank you, Janice. Um, I'm gonna collect myself uh, try here. Um, now you can see why her inspiration is why we do what we do. Um, yeah, I'm a little overwhelmed. Um, so I would also just encourage everyone to, um, when the sale is over, um, that she's offering on her book to also consider uh, independent book real, uh, retailers online. Uh, we have one in Gainesville called Third House Books, and I know Chelsea Green Publishing offers The Seed Underground. Um, we've been trying to stand in solidarity with the workers that are striking uh, for uh, fair wages and protective equipment. So just a thought um, when you're shopping to think about the, the little guys in the local economy around you. Um, so quickly on the question process, I know that uh, we have had a lot of questions probably coming in and uh, you can, like I said, you can put your questions on the agenda if you're able to access that document easily. It's a Google Doc uh, and at the bottom there's a place for questions. You can also put your questions in the chat if you can't and we will do our very best to, to moderate. Um, I am going to kind of kick the question and answer off. Um, and with some questions that had already come in with the surveys and some things that I know have been kind of burning. And many of these questions are uh, more in the technical nature, but as a way to sort of bring this back to the, to the connection point and to, to kind of uh, put Janice on the spot for a minute. Um, Janice, one of the questions that came in was, uh, can you share your practical experience on cultivating relationships, on networking and meeting other members of the seed saving community and the best, the, the, the places and the events and the, the spaces, physical or virtual, where you've, you've connected with other people who are, are living this journey of seed saving and um, caring for our environment and sustainable food. I'm good. Okay. You're good. Okay. Perfect. I, I, I don't exactly, I missed a little part of that question, but I think it's about if I, about the people that I'm meeting along the way. Is that right? Can you shake your head? Yes. It's a, about sort of how the networks, the places that you've, met people in the, the places you would recommend people go if they're looking to connect into this network and this sort of like, you know, thread of amazing people who are doing this work. Yeah. So I, so I, I think that you guys are the perfect example of this network. I mean, what you're doing in Gainesville is, is really mind blowing. So thank you for that. We've there, I believe these networks are forming all across the country, you know, Ben's put together so many seed libraries. We put together a seed library in our little local library here. I want to just for a moment talk about one of the most inspiring people I met as a seed saver in Vermont. We, we lived in Vermont for a while. My son is there. And um, I was, inter you know, I was reporting for this, uh, reporting stories for this book. And so I went to meet Sylvia DeVotz. She runs a tiny, tiny seed company called Solstice Seeds. And um, we were talking about activism. I've always been an environmental activist, you know, dressing in a penguin costume to protest climate change and doing lots and lots of crazy things, getting arrested even. And she, she said, I see in activism a kind of futility. The real action is in doing. Here's what she said. She said, the system is so broken not only broken, but destructive and self-destructive. I see in activism a kind of futility. The real power is in doing. 
The real power is in making the system, the broken system irrelevant. That means non-participation in the existing broken system. And to that end, thank you for reminding me about the striking workers. So regarding people, I believe that we are communal beings. I think attachment is one of the things that human beings do best on this earth. And no matter where we are, we find the people who love the things we love and do the things that we do. And, and that's all I'll say to that. Thank you. Thank you. Um, if any, Mel, Melissa, I guess I'll turn that question to you a little bit. If you have other ideas about, uh, or Ben, of, of networks and uh, ways to cultivate relationships and meet other members of this community. And then um, I'll also toss out the, the next question so you can address that. And then uh, the next question is um, talking about sort of plant selection and, and breeding. And I know that this is a chance to also maybe introduce one of our speakers that, or one of our experts, resident experts that's on the call, Tim, um, as well to, to talk about this. But, you know, what varieties are best for the Deep South? What, uh, what how do we know what to pick for our climate? Are there any known words of things that we should just ignore that don't go well in our climate? And then, um, yeah. So the network question and then sort of plant selection for the Deep South is the, are the two questions I'm throwing out to both Ben and Melissa. Um, so great questions. This is something we've been trying to address for a while because we have learned very early on we don't do this alone. We're way better if we can network together, share varieties, share knowledge, share our tools share our time. Um, so it's been my mission to try to educate as many people as possible about the joys of getting into this work and how to, how to share it. And the beauty about seed people is that they're by nature, very generous. Uh, they share a lot of extra of their things and their time. Um, we locally have a pretty good network of people. Of course we have, you know, our master gardeners and IFAS extension with a wealth of knowledge on things that grow well here and how to do it. We've got local garden groups like Grow Gainesville that gather in person. Of course that's on hiatus right now, sharing, you know, knowledge from local amateurs and experts and people that have been tinkering in the soil and with seeds for some time. Um, with our seed collective, we do a lot of education and outreach using social media, website in-person workshops. We're probably going to be exploring how to do more of this online stuff as it has a farther reach. Mm -hmm. um, and bigger picture, we've been working with other people in the region and nationally to think about what it looks like to actually have a Southeastern seed network, which is a whole lot of things. It's gardeners, nonprofits, plant breeders, extension agents, master gardeners, farmers, Everyone, everyone's a part of the seed system, whether you know it or not, but the people that are more integrally involved, um, connecting with one another, sharing resources, leveraging resources. Um, and there's a lot of pieces to this. We have local organic farmers that have different needs than some of us local gardeners do. And they absolutely rely on organizations that are pushing forward research on organic varieties for organic farms that have market qualities that farmers need. And then there's us gardeners like myself and Janice that are, you know, maybe not saving tons of stuff, but we're saving the things that we love and do well that we can share with people. And so um, I guess there's a lot of, there's a lot of people at different scales doing different things and networking is huge. And, you know, if you have suggestions for us, we are all ears, but we are working on a bigger network of folks. It's going to take some time to develop. In the meantime, there's lots of ways we can connect with each other via email and I hate to say it, but social media, it's great. Um, more workshops, webinars, all this stuff. I don't know if Ben or Janice have anything you want to chime in on that. Yeah. You know, um, I think those are all great points. I think that we need to remember um, to just keep having conversations with people. Um, I, I find for myself, it's far too easy to get caught into a bubble about the way that I think about things. And I, I forget that there's so much more going on around me that I may not see from the perspective that I'm looking at them. And if I remember to just keep having conversations about our food and about our seeds and about the work that I'm doing, 
people come out of the woodwork all over the place that I never would have expected. Uh, we, we, are, we have collaborations now with restaurants and chefs as part of our breeding projects, which was not an angle that I even expected to have happen. But at the end of the day, I can make selections out in the field for things that grow well, but the chefs make the selections for the food that tastes good. And that's how we translate our work to the people is, is through the dinner plate. So just having as many conversations as possible with people is, is, is crucial to, to building these networks. Um, I'm going to make a quick plug for an organization that I work with, uh, the Community Seed Network. Uh, it's communityseednetwork.org is how you would find them online. It's a collaboration between Seed Savers Exchange and the Seeds of Change organization in Canada. Um, and I'm sure that the link is in all of the resources that Melissa put together, but I wanted to just put it out there now. They have worked diligently to compile um, a, a network, a map. You can go right to the website and you can find a map and look up your locale. So no matter where you've come from, you can go to this map and find like-minded people that are doing this work right in your area. And so add yourself to that map. Let's build this network together and let's just keep keep communicating and sharing. Um, and that's how that's how we're going to get through this. That's how we're going to well, essentially save the world, right? Absolutely. Um, I'm going to take this opportunity. I'm embarrassed that I didn't introduce one of our really experienced, knowledgeable folks on the line today, Tim Noyes, because I think he might be able to help answer the other part of this question on selection for varieties that are good for the Southeast. Um, and I think Anna can clarify, I think there's a specific sort of breeding question there too. But uh, Tim Noyes, who is on the call here, he's been doing some incredible work. He is an amateur plant breeder. He taught himself how to do this and he has taken backyard tomato breeding to a whole other level and his whole intent is to find varieties that taste good and grow well that's what we do too does it taste good does it grow well check save the seeds he's out there making crosses between different varieties that he's selected for flavor and for potential ability to thrive in our climate and in i think he's probably along to like f3 or f4 by this uh point in time with his generations of seed saving and developing some cool stuff and uh besides being a wealth of knowledge in this area he is so giving of his time and his plants and he's taught many a workshop and just showed up and i'm really excited and proud to know tim and tim if you feel comfortable answering some of this because you've taught me a lot too on th what are we looking for when we're trying to choose varieties for the southeast because that is a big question we get a lot all right so um that's a good question so i just want to clarify when melissa says i'm an expert what she means is that i've failed a lot and i've learned a lot from those um failures um you know uh i would say that a lot of it you know is in that in that you fail you try a lot of different varieties you're seeing things that aren't working and along that line um you think about um the other people other panelists that are on this call angie minnow with her um her squash that she's selecting, um, Kathy with um, her um, uh, blackberries that she's trialed within her, uh, you know, her area. Um, I think of Jennifer Rex, you know, 20 years of experience. That means a lot of failures, but a lot of things that she's saving seeds from. So if you watch some of those videos, there's some really amazing stuff. And I mean, even when Melissa goes out there, she's like, oh my God, you, that, that's growing here. Or, how do you save this? You know, those work that saves the, you know, you can save the seeds. So a lot of it's going to come from your local experts. Um, go to the farmers markets, ask them. Um, a lot of your larger scale farmers um, may grow a lot of hybrid varieties, but they may also be able to give you some selections and some ideas in such, um, you know, of, of varieties that they've kept within their family that they that they that they continue to grow. In the sense of tomatoes, because that's kind of more of my direction. That's kind of you can sort of see some of the pictures here probably of my uh, tomatoes that I've actually been taking from. Uh, my garden, they're all in different stages right now, but uh, there's really only four lines on my table and I am at F4 right now with uh, my varieties. And it's kind of just, you're just kind of searching through. But when you're looking for, for varieties or you're looking for some, um, uh, some, you know, especially if you have a lot of issues, um, you, start, you start identifying what your issues are in your particular area and then you start looking for resistance and, and within seeds uh, that were in, in a catalog if you're gonna start there or start in the farmer's market, like I said. Um, when I'm growing my stuff out, like, you know, the, bi the biggest thing obviously, I think is kind of what um, uh, Ben was talking about, which was, um, 
you know, it's got to taste good because if it just because it grows doesn't and and it does really well. If you don't like to eat it, nobody else likes to eat it. It's really not going to, you know, it's really not going to hang around that long. Um, so first it's got to taste good and then it's got to be able to make, you know, you got to then come to that realization that not everything's going to grow well in your area. Every, everyone has a microclimate that's a little bit different, even if they're a block away, even if they got soil, that's a little bit different. Um, in Alachua County is where we live in Gainesville. Um, there, there's different striations. So if you go one block down, they've got, they've got almost a clay type soil, but mine is a complete sand. So identifying what your particular soils and, and everything else, then if you can find those plants that are really easy for you to grow, then jump on those. So for me, if you're asking uh, for a particular variety of tomato that grows really well, especially in Florida with humidity and disease resistance, um, look to Gary Cass. Gary Cass was a tomato breeder in Hawaii, um, and uh, he uh, bred some of the best um, tomatoes um, in the sense of disease resistance. And uh, I use those as my check for my all my varieties. So if those get diseased, then I know the varieties that I'm trialing, you know, uh, that they didn't have a shot in the, and, you know, those are kind of my, like, they're going to make every single year. So um, the variety I can tell you right now is Anahu, A-N-A-H-U, Hilani, H-E-A-L-A-N-I, Kiwalo, K-E-W-A-L-O. Those varieties are just red varieties. Um, they're not going to be that stunning, um, uh, you know, striped type tomato, they're not going to be, um, but they're going to be there for you. And, and so sometimes when you're talking about food security, which we've talked about a little bit, um, or should I say about a lot, you know, is that, um, is you need to have kind of those, but, but so, so get your stuff that's stable, get your stuff that you know is going to grow and then shift it over to trial stuff, shift it over to experiment things, because that's where you're actually going to grow. That's where you're actually going to learn a lot more things. And um, it's kind of the fun thing. So uh, obviously, like you know, what you see here um, is just kind of the beginning of my tomato season. And um, each one of these varieties, like these two, are the same. Came from the same exact tomato um, uh, last year. I mean, it's the same seeds from the same exact tomato. But you have, you still have these difference in colors and everything. So when you, if you want to get into breeding, that that's kind of fun. But it's not always, it's not always a hundred percent success. You find you have a lot, a lot of mistakes, but but that's what gardening is all about. Oh, thanks, Tim. Appreciate it. Um, so I'm just going to keep going with the questions. I know there's probably um, a lot of other questions I could build off of every question we have, and but in the, in the interest of time, I want to keep us moving. So um, I'm going to toss this one to Melissa, and then she can kind of pass it on to the other speakers. Melissa, can you talk a bit about uh, understanding and the best ways to preserve seed quality? And also within that, talk a little bit about how to determine seed quality through germination testing. Um, the question started with, "Have I have seeds in my freezer. Are they viable? Mm -hmm. um, kind of thing. So if you could start talking about seed quality storage and um, germination testing. Awesome. Great question. And I also invite some of our other folks on the line uh, to help me answer this when I'm done with my opinions. So for me, seed quality begins in the field when you're growing it. A lot of times when we teach about seed saving, the first question people ask is, well, how do I gather it? And then how do I stick it in a jar and keep it? And I kind of like to start back in the field. Um, healthy plants make healthy seeds. So we always say, you know, and unless it's a really rare variety and you just got to save the seeds off of it because it's now or never, you probably don't want to save seeds off of those plants that are struggling. Um, if they're not being taken care of and seeds, you, you know, plants that are in the seed maturity stage, you don't just forget about them. They're actually at the most important part. They're reproducing babies for the next generation. So keep taking care of those plants. Um, make sure you give the plant everything it needs to get some healthy seeds, and that will help you into the next phases of keeping those seeds around for a long time. Um, we don't all have time to grow up the same things every year to replenish seeds, so if you can do a good job of getting as many healthy seeds in one season as you can, then you have enough to share and grow for generations to come. So, so maintain your good garden practices throughout the time that you're harvesting seeds. Um, when it comes to actually bringing your seeds inside and starting to clean them up and getting them ready for the best possible storage, I like to do it as quickly as possible. And of course there's, you know, every plant has its own 
way and its own nuances so that we get it as good as possible for keeping the quality up. Tomatoes and cucurbits, I highly recommend fermenting them. And there's videos you can watch online of how to do this. It helps sift away the seeds that are not good, that you don't want to waste your time drying and storing. It can help reduce disease instance, incidents. And it also gets rid of some of the gooey film that comes with the seeds and helps you keep them really nice and makes it a lot nicer to share with people. Um, and for things that have dry material around them, some kind of seed pod like a bean or a mustard or an arugula, you wanna get those as dry as possible and really as quickly as you can get that material removed. Um, there is a possibility, especially in our climate where we are fighting humidity pretty much 365 days a year of molds forming and getting the seed contaminated, which will deteriorate um, its quality and reduce how long you can keep it. And it can also harbor little insects in there. Can't tell you how many times I've left a pile of beans for a while and just kicked myself because later I go and there's some little weevils in there. But if I had cleaned those seeds up quicker, dried them down quicker, got them in the freezer, I might have avoided that mess. Um, and there's three main things you wanna to do to keep your seeds high quality and as lasting as long as possible. You wanna keep your seeds cool, dark, and dry. We're trying to make them hibernate. We don't want them to be awake. They are alive, they are very much awake. We still have to take care of these little living things, but we don't wanna give them things they need to grow, which is light and moisture um, and, and heat. So we wanna to try to remove those things. And in our climate, particularly dry, if I have to pick one of those things for you to focus on, it's dry, 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 dry. Moisture makes seeds breathe a little bit more. So they're respiring and they're using up their stores which is not good because you want them to have that when they go in the soil. Uh, moisture encourages insects. They can't really survive below about 30% relative humidity. So if you can knock your humidity down, the bugs can't breathe and you won't have any. And you also reduce incidence of any fungal or bacterial stuff growing on your seeds. So get them dry, get them in a nice sealed container. Mason jars are awesome because they've got that nice rubber gasket and you have the lovely opportunity to gaze at your seeds through the through the jars too um, but hopefully they're in a dark closet somewhere and there's nothing wrong with freezing your seeds it can definitely make them last a lot longer just make sure they're as dry as they can be if your seeds especially your big ones like your beans and your corn if they're not fully dried down yet and you freeze them there is a chance that all the moisture in the cells, the, the um, water when it freezes will destroy some of the cells so you want to try to Make sure they're dry, but freezer is good. It'll let them last a long time. Make sure it's in a nice sealed jar. Um, refrigerator, I don't know. I would like to see what other seed savers think about the refrigerator. I've kind of poo-pooed it because I feel like it gets opened and closed way too many times in a day. And a seed is very much in tune to its environment. And so when you open, close, open, close, open, close, and the humidity changes and the temperature changes, it's confusing for a seed and we really want it to stay stable. Um, and plus home refrigerators can actually get quite humid. I've stuck my hygrometer in there a few times just to see and it's it's too humid for a seed. So I would like to just see you dry your seeds down, get them in a nice tight jar or other sealable thing that won't let air or water in and put them in maybe a dark closet in your house um, or in your freezer. And certainly don't keep them in the shed. Don't keep it on top of your refrigerator you know, don't keep it somewhere where there's just too much going on. So let's put our seeds to sleep and be kind to them. And uh, that'll hopefully get you through a few years. And I'd be happy to hear if anyone else, if I forgot something or you want to challenge something I said. That's awesome. Bernice, yeah, I, I guess up. I would just say, if you could talk a little bit about how you can tell if your seeds are good. Mm. You know, if you've got a bunch of seeds that you've had in storage for a long time, how do you like what's the best method for figuring right. out are they worth planting or am I going to waste my time nurturing yeah. babies? Awesome question. I would do a germ test before I spend time sowing them out in the field. Um, if it's something that I don't have a lot of seed left and I feel like a germ test is going to be wasteful because if I'm being honest, we do so many germ tests and when they come up, they just go in the compost. But sometimes I've only got a few things left of something rare. So I'll actually plant them in a tray in the greenhouse or somewhere where I can, you know, test out their germination. But then if they actually grow, I can stick them out in the garden and not um, worry about wasting them. 
but germination testing is a good skill to develop and there's lots of videos online to see how to do it. We posted one on our seed school platform and it could be something, maybe we can do some videos in the future and people got unmuted. I meet myself, there we go. Um, so germination tests, it's a really great thing to learn how to do. It does save you time. You know, you don't want to waste a lot of time sowing things out in the field or starting them in flats if they're no good. Um, a little nuance to seed germination testing. Okay. I'm unmuted now. Can you all hear me? I don't know what happened there. Okay, um, so if your little seedlings are germinating, you're doing a germ test on some paper towel or you splurged and got some really nice germination paper, which is really nice. If you do it a lot, I would actually recommend getting the good stuff. Um, it does make a difference, but I started for years just on paper towels. And if they come up, it's good, but take a look at how good they look because sometimes if they have deteriorated over time um, and they might not have quite enough energy in their embryo to bust out of their seed coat and start growing those little cotyledons, you want to look and see like maybe a few of them have come up and they look vigorous and they're great, they're ready to go, and then there's a handful that are just stunted. Um, they're viable, but they might not necessarily grow into vigorous plants. And so you can get a rough estimate for not only, you know, how much of your seed is viable, but how much of it is vigorous. Um, and I don't think I have time to like talk specifically about germ tests. There is a lot of stuff online, but I would be happy to um, At a later point maybe walk people through some of the things we've learned, but it's pretty basic stuff You know wet paper towel put your seeds in a certain way make sure they stay lightly moistened uh, Keep an eye on them every day count how many germinate how many don't and do some basic math Great. I'd like Thank to add you. to that um, yeah. if I could real quick um, what Melissa mentioned about uh, making these selections at the germination test period um, is important to consider when we think about making selections later down the line for plants that have performed well at the end of the season or uh, fruits to vegetables that have good flavor. When we make those selections, we're making selections at the beginning as well for healthy, vigorous plants, for early emergence, whatever it is. So we want to be conscious as seed savers through the entire process of, of that seed's life its entire reproductive cycle that we make, we're conscious to make the decisions to, to, to improve that variety as we go. Every time we save seeds, we're essentially plant breeders, right? And we want to be aware of that from seed to seed that we're making those choices because everything that's a selection is altering the next generation of that plant. Thanks, Ben. Um, ben, I'm going to toss the next question to you to start, actually. Okay. Um, can you talk a little bit about... Um, there, it, so this group of questions is sort of like, uh, how do you make sure things don't cross? Um, what do you do when you're trying to save seed varieties from the same families like brassicas or corn? Different, of course, there's differences there between wind pollinated and insect pollinated. Um, and uh, how do you know if things have crossed versus have safe, you know, have integrity? Okay, so I, uh, there's a couple of different ways I, I suppose to ensure proper isolation of our plants to avoid cross-pollination. Um, one is obviously understanding the biology of the particular species that you're growing um, and how it is being pollinated, right? Understanding the, the plant itself, um, if it's wind pollinated, insect pollinated, um, what's happening there so you can, you can prepare for that. Um, in, in most cases, not, of us, not all of us have the ability to have the, the literal physical isolation. We, you know, I, I don't have a half a mile to put between my melon varieties, right, to ensure that that happens. Um, so in some cases we can stagger planting. So, so for some things with brassicas, say what we do here is, you know, brassicas, a lot of them are biennials. So we stagger them out. So year one, this particular variety flowers, right? And then while I'm growing the year, the second variety for its first year. So then year two, the second variety. So we alternate years that we allow those plants to flower. Um, so that's one way that we can do it. We can hand pollinate varieties. I always recommend people learn how to hand pollinate. We'll start with some large squashes, some maximas or something. They have a big flower. They're really easy to work with. Um, there's a lot of online tutorials that we can look into. There may be some in the resources Melissa put together to walk us through how to hand pollinate a flower. So first, again, it comes back to that understanding of how 
these plants are being pollinated, how the insect moves the pollen from the, from the, to the pistillate or from the staminate flower to the pistillate flower, um, the male flower to the female flower, some people like to say, um, and seeing how that process works in nature so we can replicate that at home under a controlled environment. Um, another way is understanding the species of the plants that we grow. So uh, Janice had mentioned the orange eggplant that she had bought from me. Um, now, I grow that orange eggplant for two reasons. One, oh, man, it's delicious, right? It's a great eggplant, and we enjoy it here at home. But the reason that we started growing it is because it's actually an African species. It's uh, Solan Solanum aethiopicum, right? It's a different species than the typical Asian eggplant that most of us grow, Solanum melangina, right? And that's the reason that we brought it, because I can grow two different eggplants in my limited amount of space they're different species. I don't have to worry about crossing. I get a bunch of diversity in my garden and on my dinner plate. I have pure seeds to sh save and share with everybody. With very little effort on my part. So really taking the time to educate ourselves and understand the plants that we're working with is the way that we're going to be able to make certain situations work for having diversity and pure seed to save. There's a lot of uh, variables from one crop to the next, so we can't get into all of them. But I think that just taking the time to develop our relationships with our plants that grow our food is, is, is key to success in so many different things. Awesome. I just wanted to take a minute at this stage to also point out all of you online probably know this because you've already started perusing the resources, but um, the, you know, this, this is just a sort of introduction and an in, a day of inspiration for you, but uh, Melissa and the other folks here at Working Food, along with um, all of the many, many experts that are on this call and beyond have spent countless hours developing resources. Um, the Seed to Seed book that was mentioned, Seed Savers has a really great seed saving book, um, and there's a ton of resources. And so our online seed school is available to you 24 hours a day, seven days a week on our website. And it's split really conveniently into a, a series of sections. Melissa will talk more about it in a little while, but a lot of this information, like the how to's and the details of what people are touching on is there. So if you feel frustrated that your question didn't get answered in detail, know that you'll be able to find the answers in those resources online. Okay. Uh, so the next question is one that I'm going to toss out to all three of you. Um, maybe uh, Ben can start since he's been doing this for a bit. Uh, so this says, what resources are best for someone that wants to do seed saving for a larger scale of farming beyond backyard gardening, um, growing on a commercial or economically viable, dare to dream that's possible, um, seed saving and uh, what, you know, what are your, what's your advice and places to start for growing seed commercially? or at least for a farm to save their own seed. You're sure. muted, Ben. Yep, I got it. Um, so I think that we don't want to put the cart before the horse in that situation. I, I've had friends that have been interested in growing seed commercially, and they say, this is where I want to go. Uh, we, we, we've done some seed saving on a small scale for our own farm. We've figured out some tricks and, and things, and we want to kind of scale up and make this um, – make this work financially for us. I think that there's two aspects to that. One, you said economically viable. I think culturally significant and economically viable need to be two words that go together. The, the crops that we grow for our food as well as for our seeds, if we want them to work, they need to be culturally significant. We have to have that relationship with our place and the people that are going to consume them. Understanding the final destination of our products and why it matters to our consumer is key to commercial success in anything. Um, so cultural significance is important. Growing food that relates to the place and people, growing seed that relates to the place and people is essential. Um, two, you have to understand where you're selling your products. Um, developing that market in advance is, is going to be astronomically more successful than producing the seed and then wondering what you're going to do with it. Um, setting up those relationships, developing those relationships with the businesses, the final outcomes. If you want to say sell retail, there's a lot of aspects that you have to understand with licensing and, and regulations and, and, and developing a retail platform to sell these seeds. If you're looking to sell your seeds wholesale, um, that's a whole relationship that you have to build there. Where do you want your seeds to go? Um, so you could think about seeds from an aspect of you just want to sell them in bulk to somebody like Michigan Gardener so they can repackage them and sell them. 
or do you do you want to think about it from a more ethical standpoint and say I want to grow I want to sell companies sell my seeds to companies that are going to respect and understand the individual growers themselves right there's there's a lot of seed companies and I always recommend smaller scale companies for this because they understand the person the place that, that grows the seeds it's not just a commodity as seed savers we have to understand that seeds are not commodities they're not just to be bought and sold their relationships with with everything that we do comes from seeds and if we want to move into seeds from a commercial standpoint we have to it's a fine line to walk to be ethical and responsible with our seeds so i think i think the philosophy of that is, is paramount to success as well um, for the for the long-term viability of any seed company Awesome points, Ben. 100% agree. Um, I can chime in a little bit. This is definitely not my domain. I'm more of the backyard homesteader scale of seed saving, but I've been to enough conferences and talked to enough seed companies to have some valid opinions, I suppose. Um, I will say I have not met a seed producer yet that grows for a company that has said it's been a lucrative business. Most of them have admitted that it is something they do because they care. They know it's important for many reasons. Um, primarily, some of them that I heard from just recently at the Organic Seed Growers Conference, they did it out of necessity because nothing that they could get out of commercial seed catalogs did well for them in their particularly challenging climates, Minnesota and Utah, to name a couple. Um, so they did it out of necessity to preserve their own varieties and then were able to sell to seed companies um, and you know commercially scaling up to do that level of seed production is a whole other animal and I would be happy to talk to someone that's you know actually ready to do it you've been growing and saving seeds for a while and you're ready for the next level but it would involve a lot more careful planning you know a lot of farmers grow 10 different types of squashes in a season for the market and that's really challenging if you wanted to save a squash variety for a seed company for example you've got to redo your whole farm plan around that. You might need better equipment. You don't want to spend hours and hours hand processing pumpkins out of stuff. You're going to need an implement on your tractor to process those seeds and clean them up. Um, negotiating with seed companies, the prices are all over the board with how much you can get per pound or per ounce. Some things are worth a lot more others are worth hardly anything and you have to think about the time and there are some tools that organic seed alliance has they have a lot of stuff i would recommend checking them out if you're at any level you're at actually they have great stuff for all levels but for commercial scale growers they have a um where are my words now it's like a uh, i can't think of the words but it's like a, a spreadsheet budget you can type in your estimated costs of what it takes to grow a particular crop, thinking about the labor, the inputs, and then um, on the other side, like what you can actually get from a seed company for your seeds. And it really helps you break down how much that costs you. And some of the farmers that use that tool are just like, nah, <laughs> I'm just gonna lose so much money doing that, or maybe it's worth it for me to do this specialized cut flower, but not so much the squash, because I just can't get a good price for it, it's not worth it. Um, and to put the commercial part aside and then we can move on, I would say that farmers or, you know, larger scale people that are producing seed for themselves is a huge cultural relevance and economic benefit. Um, like Ben was saying, you know, there's farmers again, like the two I just mentioned um, briefly that were from Minnesota and Utah that just had such challenging climates. If they wanted to farm and have food, they had to save their own seeds. They had to adapt them and breed them and develop them, or they were going to be struggling with stuff out of the seed catalogs that just didn't work for them. Um, so that can be something worth considering. And if you can develop your own variety of something, um, that's useful to your community and has relevance, like the tomatoes that Tim is working on that will, you know, they've been available to all of us here if you've wanted them. Uh, Angie working on her seminal squash and Janice on her squash, like these are the seeds that we can save that are culturally important to us and maybe we're not gonna make any money off them except for some self-addressed stamped envelopes that we exchange with each other for the seeds. Um, but if there is a lot of interest in commercial seed production, I would be happy at a later point to maybe dive in um, with some folks on that topic. Great, thank you, Melissa. Okay, I'm gonna 
toss this one Janice's way as a starter since she's our storyteller and resident researcher on the call in terms of, of information research. Um, this question is about uh, what kind of information should I be recording about my seeds, um, about where they came from, about how they're doing in the field, um, and if I don't have access to information about a given variety, how can I research it? Oh my gosh, that is not a question for me. That is a question. <laughs> so I keep a little garden journal, which I I tried to remember this morning to bring down so I could show you. And I I just write down, I, I have to keep it simple because there's so much going on in my life. But I write down when I planted something and, and uh, how many days, I try to get down how many days until it comes up. But mainly my work is is just is visual and uh, oral you know so it, it does well it doesn't have that it, you know it doesn't have too many too much insect burden and then I think this is great I will also say maybe you tell me do do you guys have I've, I've gone through the material but do you have a list of varieties that you're really recommending that do well in our area, uh, you know, with the sandy soil and high humidity and high heat? Because that is my main, like, that's what I'm really working on is what can I grow that I love and taste good. And so if anybody can point me in a direction to here's a list of what we've tried and these work, but that's it. I, I keep it very simple. Yeah. Melissa, do you want to talk about the things you like for seed savers that are saving for our seed library to record? And when you're going to, to kind of get a new variety from somebody, what um, information you ask them for? Sure. And then I'm going to turn it over to Tim because I know he's got some thoughts as well. Um, first, to answer Janice's question, um, Yes, I have a spreadsheet that I've been working on and my homework this summer is to make that available to everyone. Every time someone has sent me a Facebook message or told me something in person or however recommended a variety, I've been dumping it into a spreadsheet. And at this point, obviously this needs to be out there for folks. So I'm going to do my very best to clean that up and put it out there. It was done primarily because I felt like the only resource we had that was at least easy to find was from UF IFAS, University of Florida IFAS, and they have some great varieties in there, but they were missing a whole lot, and they were missing a whole lot of cool things that our collective knowledge has that just isn't in that table. So we will work on getting that out, and I want it to be a living document where we can add things as we learn. Um, as far as information gathering, I would just say more information the better. Um, when we get seeds donated to us or we go to a seed swap and it's just labeled brown bean or something and there's no date and there's no name and I don't have information on how it grew or how someone enjoyed it or what the story is, if there even is one. Well, there always is, but sometimes we haven't recorded it. Um, I really need to know that information or it's hard for me to want to take the time to grow it out to see what it is and definitely not to share it with anyone except with a big caveat of like, I don't know what this is, but this brown bean showed up at a seed swap. Do you want to try it? So at the very least, the year that the seed was saved in your name, be thinking about, um, you know, when you planted it and when you harvested it um, as an organization that's trying to facilitate the sharing of seeds that are high quality. I do also want to know a little bit about your practices to avoid cross pollination and how, you know, do you grow organically <clears throat> or not? Um, all of the information is useful. And so I have a hard time saying definitely these two things, but um, definitely the considerations you took to make sure it's pure or maybe it's not, maybe it's a really diverse land race and you just let things go buck wild and that's cool. I want to know that too the year your name so I can follow up with you and dig in and ask more questions to really get the story around this because uh, I mean we've all seen if you read in a seed catalog or go online to shop for seeds the variety that has the best story and the most information is the one that you're excited to pick when there's just something that says you know how many days to harvest and that's a red tomato I usually gloss over it unless something jumps out to me. 
Um, and I'm going to pass this off to Tim and let him fill in with because he's uh, got a lot of record keeping to do with the breeding program. You, uh, you and uh, Ben both uh, made, which is the story, to for a um, seed um, to be valuable, uh, for a seed to be continued to be saved, it really needs to have a story. If if what like Melissa said, it just says brown bean on it, those things disappear. Um, it, it, when you keep, so it is not only um, uh, your responsibility to keep um, the seed. Um, but it's it's important to keep um, not only the information about the seed, so the type of seed, it, uh, the type of plant, um, the the uh, striping that you saw, if there was striping, if there's anything in particular, disease resistance, um, height, uh, productivity, those are things that you want to keep. Because it, think of it, if you're at a farmer's out of uh, at a farmer's market and you're selling this this um, uh, vegetable, you can tell them so much more. You know that story. People want that. Versus, oh, what's that red tomato? I don't know. I got it out of Johnny Seeds. Uh, this is not a slight at Johnny Seeds, but um, there's the story that, oh, that's my grandfather's. He's been growing it for however many years. And if you keep a journal, which I keep a small, you know, I always keep something. I mean, you can get something s small and simple like that from like Target or something like that. And I write little things down about the particular plant so that next year when all I have is a little seed to look at, I know a little bit more of what I'm expecting to see. So if there is something that's different, that it comes out. That's also important too to have an idea of what the story is and the t in in and know the variety um, well uh, and even for known varieties and stable varieties because small things change over time. Um, so the variety, the Everglades, if no one pays attention to it, no one keeps the record of its size and everything else. You might start selecting for things and you didn't realize it, and it's getting larger and larger, or uh, it's getting smaller, or the flavor changes. So having a good understanding of um, of even stable seeds that you're keeping and saving the seeds from, um, and then looking back at the history, are things changing? Am I selecting the right way to ensure the stability of a, a particular um, seed is also important, especially when you pass it on. Because otherwise, if you can give that some, that some person, when they talk to them about the, the particular seed and you tell them this is what it is, and if you've got a passion and excited about it, man, they're, they're going to they're gonna get really passionate. Now, they may, they may or may not grow, which I've learned you have to just accept. They may or may not grow the seed you gave them. But when they do, they get really excited and they want to talk to you about it. And that's that connection that Ben was kind of talking about too, that community that you start building. And when you can start doing that, they can save the seed for you also. And so it's not just you yourself. So I do want to say though, uh, just in case I don't get another chance to speak, um, the reason, you know, the, the things, the reasons why varieties disappear is because the people stop growing them. We can't always blame everybody else for, for that. It's our responsibility to continue to grow those varieties. So it is our responsibility to be stewards of those seeds that we find that are really good. If we let that go, there's no one else to blame but yourself. Awesome. No pressure or anything. Yeah, right. <laughs> ben, did you have anything else you wanted to add to record keeping or the way you record stories or data about your seeds? Absolutely. Um, you know, one of the things that when I, when I collect seeds at a seed swap or other event, um, I, you know, I, I always ask for contact information. Um, and you know, it's, it's so crucial for me to be able to follow up later when I have more time to think about it with some of these folks. One example, um, it's the, it's the story in my book from our seeds and their keepers is a young man that came, I was at a seed swap and this young man showed up and he said, Oh, I've got these seeds that were in my grandmother's freezer. They've been in there for like 50 years. I don't know if they're any good anymore. Do you want them? And I was like, oh, sure, kid, you know. And I took them, and I didn't think much of it. And then I took those seeds home, and I got 70% germination on these seeds. And I still grow the tomato to this day. It is, it's one of the best tomatoes that we grow each year. And I, I kick myself every time that I didn't get this kid's contact information so I could follow up with him to learn more about this seed. Um, seeds are our connection to everything that has happened before us. As seed savers, sure we want to think about saving this, this history for, for practical purpose in the garden, but as seed savers, we are storytellers and historians, and there is no, no difference between those two things. If we choose to save a seed, we take on the responsibility of saving its history and its story and making sure that we pass that on every time we pass on the seed. To, to me, there, there's no separation between those concepts. They are one and the same. 
uh, every time we save that seed, we save that story and we become a part of that story. Um, I could tell, I could tell tales all day about the importance of, of seeds and their stories. I've written two books about it, right? Um, when we talk about like the Cherokee black bean, um, what people want to call the Cherokee trail of tears. And I get into this in depth in the video that I made for, for Melissa, which can be found in the, in the resources there. Um, people know that story and they want to grow that seed because that story is relevant to them and it means something. And it gives that, that level of importance to that seed. If I just gave you a package that said random black bean or random brown bean, like Melissa said, it's only going to mean so much to you. There's only going to be so much value. Unless it's just the best taste, tastiest bean you've ever had, it's, it's going to quickly be forgotten and lost. But when it's got that, that cultural significance, that relevance in history that, that brings that excitement to us, then we say, oh, I'm going to steward this variety. Um, and we've been able to, you know, the Trail of Tears bean obviously comes from a time well before the Trail of Tears. And, and we can follow that story back so far and learn so much about so many people. I collected a corn seed from a lady. Her name was Sylvia. And when we talked about this corn seed, I learned so much about the corn itself and the variety and how it was grown and so many things. But as Sylvia told me about her corn, she told me the stories that she remembered as a kid and, and, and the corn mill and the, the plants that her mom would make medicine from. And I realized that inside of every seed is so much about the history of the people and every person that has ever touched, grown, and eaten that seed. That if we try to think about seed saving and storytelling as two separate things, we're doing ourselves and everyone after us and everyone before us a great disservice. So I think that those things really, they're inseparable. And I think that that's important to remember. Uh, it's a responsibility when we grow seeds to, to maintain every part of that seed. And that includes its history. That's beautiful. Thank you. Um, if I can just, I would like to just add on a little bit. I know we probably have more questions, but uh, I don't know how recent this is, but in the past several years in the seed savers movement as a whole, there's been a lot of discussion around some of the very serious nature of these seeds that we're carrying with us and their history, who they really came from, who they were stolen from, the horrific history we have in this country and around the world of genocide and taking from other people. And there's a movement called rematriation of seeds that uh, Rowan White is a big proponent of and uh, Ken Green with Hudson Valley Seed Library, Chris Hubbard with the Wildwood Farms Seed Collection. And they've really been trying to trace the story. Like Ben mentioned briefly, the Cherokee Trail of Tears being, I mean, that's what we're calling it. But like, what about the people before that horrific event happened? Like, can we call it something different or go back further in that story and be sharing that with people and being really honest with ourselves about the seeds that I'm carrying in our collection, for example, aren't mine. I'm a part of the story because I've carried them forward and I've shared them with people. But a lot of them came here uh, to the South with people that were drug over here and that were enslaved and were growing them in these plantations as their sustenance. There's a really big story here and a big responsibility to be honest with the story of these seeds that we're keeping and also to acknowledge that we're a part of this story and that we do our due diligence to tell it, to share the seeds. And again, not to commodify them as much as we can because this is a collective, a collective resource we have as, as humans. For sure, thank you, Melissa. It's a very important point. And I think it's something to be thinking about as we move into this. I think there's, you know, a lot of our structures, our food structures and our food system are built on the backs of exploitation of people throughout history. And if we can have this movement, this, this amazing revolution of seed saving, um, be one that does it right or does it better, um, by figuring out how the benefits that we, um, gain from seed saving and, and seed sharing get, uh, benefit those who, uh, brought those seeds to us and who, who are the sort of arbiters of those seeds, then I think we can be a model um, of the way in which you can do that better um, or well. We'll see. Um, anyway, uh, so a lot of the questions that we have now are pretty technical type questions. So uh, some of them are even just yes or no's. So Mal, I'm going to put a couple of them to you. And then if there's somebody else that you know that's on the phone that's an expert who could answer these questions better, let me know. 
Um, this one is a, a, if you harvest a seed, does the viability change with time lag from harvest? Example is the seminal pumpkin, freshly harvested versus six months or, you know, those pumpkins behind Denise that are almost a year old. Are the seeds inside those as good as they were when you first harvested the pumpkin? Hmm. Great question. I'm going to give my opinions and then ask the other seed savers out there to chime in. Um, my experience with that crop in particular, um, I like them to mature on my kitchen table for at least a few weeks, maybe a few months before I eat them because the, uh, the flesh sweetens and tastes better. Also, the seeds have a little more time to plump up and get big and juicy before we harvest them for storing for planting next year. That said, some of the Seminole pumpkins, one of their many amazing traits is that they keep for a long time. So when I've cut into one after a year, sometimes the seeds are getting a little bit funky or I'll notice maybe some of them have even germinated <laughs> inside the pumpkin. So sitting inside the pumpkin for too long of a time, maybe not such a good thing in terms of mold issues potentially um, or germinating. Uh, once they're extracted, assuming that they're a good seed and you've dried them down properly and stored them, of course, over time, because seeds are living creatures, they slowly lose their, their juju to be seeds when you want to grow them out. So, you know, a one-year-old seminal pumpkin seed kept well is probably going to have more of a chance of success than one that's maybe 10 years old that's been kept in subpar conditions. I hope that answers the question and I'd be happy to turn this over to Tim or Angie or Ben or anyone on the line there that might have some thoughts on that. Also, I think as you're talking about this, Ben or Angie, or um, if you could talk about how you um, just in the broad brushstrokes, obviously, again, this is addressed in the, in the curriculum, but how you um, clean and dry your seeds. Do you use a dehydrator? Um, you know, are, can you use a dehydrator? If so, what temperature? Just kind of this general, like, how do you clean and dry a seed? Um, so first, to, to speak directly to what Melissa said um, about the, the seeds and, and the squash, how well it stores. I actually grow Seminole pumpkins here in Michigan, um, and they do phenomenally well for me here, and I absolutely love them. Um, you, you guys did a great job with that, um, and we really have, have been enjoying it here. Um, now they do store well and i have some from last year that are just there i mean they're just like they came off the vine they're, they're absolutely wonderful and i have had that situation where when i cut these these squash open that have been there for a year some of them are a little more funky some of them started to sprout certainly um but i make selections again all the way through the life cycle of my plant and because i grow a majority of my food here storage squash is essential to what i do um, and i select for squash that store. The longer that squash can sit in, in the cupboard here, the, the more I want the seeds from it. Um, and we select those seeds specifically for our own use because that, that's an important trait to me all the way through. So, so making those selections is, is, is vital. Now a squash to save and harvest, to just to get into it, I do have a video on our YouTube channel about squash seeds that we just posted up on there. Um, but it's essentially simple, making sure that your fruit is ripe is very, very important. Um, a lot of folks, you know, you'll see like an acorn squash that you buy at the grocery store is green. A green acorn squash isn't ripe. Um, and you're not going to get nearly as many viable seeds out of it as you would as if like, you let that fruit ripen up, it'll actually turn orange. Um, and that's when you're going to get more seeds. So understanding, understanding your plants again is, is crucial to success. So you get a nice ripe fruit, you cut it open, you essentially scoop the seeds right out of it, um, put them out on a colander or something, rinse them, wash them, get all the bits of debris, sugars and things off of them, get them nice and clean, and then put them out on something to dry. We use a lot of screens. You can get screens, Southern Exposure Seed Exchange um, sells screen building materials on their website. Um, but if you're, if you're not into that or you're not handy enough to build, you can literally repurpose an old window screen. That works just fine. I've got old screen doors on sawhorses all over our barn that we put seeds and things out on to dry. Um, on a small scale at home, you can use a paper plate. I love to use paper plates because you can write right on the paper plate what it is because you want to make sure you label everything every step of the way. Put the seeds out to dry seven to 10 days or so. Um, make sure they're good and dry. When you think your seeds are dry, leave them for a few more days because just they, they appear dry on the outside does not mean they're dry all the way through. And Melissa got into why that's important. 
when we talk about storage. You know, you want to make sure your seeds are good and dry. Um, and then label your seeds and put them away. It's literally that simple. I, f I firmly believe that seed saving should be included in cookbooks. It's a step of processing food, right? It's, it's literally something that we do in our kitchens almost every time we prepare a meal do we interact with seeds. And we've gotten so far away from thinking about seeds in the kitchen that people will scoop the squash seeds out and they'll throw them in the compost or wherever they do with them. You're literally 50% done saving seeds from the squash at that point. It just has to wash them up and put them out to dry. Um, and if we could include seed saving as a part of food preparation, maybe that would help people see the significance of it. Because it's something, like I said, that we do every single time we cook food, we interact with seeds. Thanks, Ben. So we're uh, coming up on the end of our, our time together. And I want to make sure that Melissa has some time to just quickly show you some of what um, she's put online and to kind of give you a little teaser for some of the things that are coming in the future um, with what we hope to do. And I will say, um, you know, based on some of the questions that have come up and uh, some of the information that we've gotten, we'll certainly comb through that and kind of think about what that means for future. And if you had a specific question that didn't get answered, I know Melissa and Sarah are hoping to kind of go through those and uh, try to get you answers if they can or to post answers um, online. And then the last thing I'll say um, is that uh, I, I felt that there was a real interest in Janice's book from all the questions about where it is. So um, I'd love to host a book club uh, with folks if they're interested um, in being a part of a book club with some of the books that both Ben and Janice have written. And um, so stay tuned for more information on that uh, on our website and on our social media. And with that, I'm going to turn it over to Melissa to bring us home. All right. Thank you. I'm almost speechless. I mean, just the connections here and the experience and the sharing and the resources. I think I cried about five times during this whole thing. So thank you for that. Um, so I do want to just again point to you in case you haven't had a chance to check it out. Um, I spent a lot of time curating some of my favorite resources and people and videos and documents and all the things that have been in my head and in my PowerPoints for the last 10 years into one space for you to enjoy on Working Foods website. I'm going to keep it there. It's going to be a living and evolving thing, just like a seed. So please, if you're looking at it and you see things that I'm missing or something's wrong or you see a typo, like please email Sarah or myself and we will address that. I'll get on doing the variety recommendation spreadsheet, which again can be a living, breathing seed. As we learn new things, we will dump it in there, keeping it tight for the Southeast, of course. Um, and with that, I would say, you know, this is something that Tim taught me a lot. Don't be afraid to fail. All of this is about learning and making mistakes and learning from those mistakes and being a better grower, being a better seed saver. And there's so much you can dive into on our Seed School website and get lost in the black hole of how to do things just right and exactly the right way and just jump in and do it. The first time I saved seeds, I had no idea what I was doing. I just saw basil seeds and it seemed like I should grab them. I didn't have 300 basil plants growing or even 20. I just saw the seeds and I took them. And it was the start to learning. And we're here for you, whatever journey you're in, wherever you are, if you're just starting, you're halfway through if you're really experienced we are here to support what you're doing and in turn we hope that you can give back to the community and help us do this um, we absolutely can't do it alone there's no reason we should and it wouldn't even be fun if we did you all out there have a wealth of experience and knowledge and seeds to share with us and I would like to go back to the two questions I posed earlier that you can share with us in the chat or do it in the Google Doc or email me later when it feels right or put it in the uh, Seed School survey. What do you need to be supported in this journey? What can we do better and more to help this network keep growing of people? And what do you have to offer? Maybe it's nothing right now. Maybe you just need to dig into the garden a little bit more and learn about how to save seeds and get good at it and learn from your plants and from yourself. Maybe you're at a point where 
you could grow out seeds at a bigger level that would help us share them with more people. Maybe you're an energetic, outgoing teacher and you want to help spread the gospel of seeds because we get asked so many times to speak and go places and we just can't do it all. And I don't want to be the only face of seeds out there. We need a lot more and there are certainly tons of you. So get out there and try, even if it's just one thing you're saving. If all of us on this call, how many people are currently on this call? 69. We had 88 earlier. If everyone here saved just one thing, we would have 88 varieties in our collective seed bank. And that's a lot. So keep saving, keep trying. And us just regular people without plant degrees, without horticultural master's degrees, without plant genetics backgrounds, we can do this. We always have for 10,000 plus years. So please just get out there and try. Tell us what you need. Tell us what you have. And I hope that my little seeds out there, you disperse away from this and land on some fertile soil. Thank you. Thanks everyone. And thank you, Janice and Ben and Tim for giving us your time and your, your information and expertise. We so appreciate it. All right, everyone, we recorded this and we hope that the recording worked and we'll be able to share it in some way, shape or form. Um, and we'll definitely be reading through all the comments so that we can be sure to listen to the answers you gave us to the questions. Have a great rest of your Saturday and a beautiful day today. Thank you. Bye, everyone.